Hello, hello, Photopilot Rafael the Bar here, as always. Today I'm super happy to have the great Rachel Jones with us. Welcome, Rachel, to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. <laughs> yeah, I think it's your third time. <laughs> yeah. So I can't wait, uh, because today we're going to have a masterclass on how to photograph auroras. Rachel, what are we going to learn today? Um, we are going to focus a lot on the planning side of aurora photography, because I think that's the first step. And um, towards the end, we will cover gear and some of the settings for shooting the sky. But we might need to do a part two because I know a lot of you wrote in on social media with a lot of questions. And it is going to be a big class today. So we'll see how far we get. And um, yeah. And then maybe, Rafa, you just have to have me back. I'm excited. I mean, you have all our doors always open, so <laughs> you, you're already invited to come back with us. And uh, that's true. Planning is such a key thing. Uh, after seeing you, you know, planning in the field in our, you know, adventure in the Rockies this year, we had a, we had a blast photographing the rotors. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait to uh, for you to to share your workflow on you know you're in, you're there in the aurora location supposedly and where where you go how you plan how you get the, to the locations how 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 do you how do you decide where to go and when to to photograph the aurora so really excited yes and there's a there's a lot to that like the you know we you you got to plan <laughs> plan and pray right plan and pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. And um, so a lot of this is going to be on that today, but definitely going to cover settings and, and some of the gear and those questions as well. And predicting Aurora, also reading the Aurora data and how to, how to know like when you even go out and shoot. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Oh, perfect. And uh, you guys watching this live, if you have questions, please uh, don't be shy and share your questions in the chat. Because we have, as always, the great Sandra Vallaura, uh, Sandra Vallaura helping us in the in the comments, answering questions, and also she will be forwarding your questions to us, so Rachel can answer you. So, Rachel, are you ready? I am ready. I am ready. So, so before I before I launch into everything Aurora, I do want to just say that I am not a vampire. I do go out and shoot during the day. I thought I should um, post a little evidence here, um, just just so everybody knows um, <laughs> <laughs> that daytime shooting does happen. Um, often, you know, just just happens to be that uh, we're still out there from the night shoot. But, anyways, yeah, day shooting still happens. Yeah, in the Rockies, we shot uh, sunrise, sunsets, and night sky, all well, everything. We we did it all, definitely yeah. did it all. Um, and I do do workshops on Aurora and Milky Way chasing. Um, my next one that I have any openings in would be early March of next year, or sorry, well, late March of next year. Um, and a little teaser for you guys, Rafa and I are going to be launching a new expedition, probably for yeah. November of this year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stick around, you can find out more about that. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Can't wait. Probably we're gonna be <laughs> releasing it after the Photopilot scam next uh, next week because you're coming to Menorca, by the way. <laughs> yes. On, uh, I... Tomorrow or on Friday? I leave tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so just squeezing in one last presentation and then I'll be packing my bags and I'll see you at camp. Perfecto. So um, yeah, uh, at the end, we'll talk to you a little bit about what we're planning for November. Um, we had a great time in March this year. And when we were here, or when Rafa and Tony were here, um, all I could think of is what else I want to show them, you know, because it was so much fun. Everything that we did was like such a, a big scenery for all of our guests as well. So um, I kept saying like, oh, you have to see this in, you know, in November when the lakes are not frozen yet and there's still snow everywhere. And, and anyway, so it all sort of evolved from there. And um, that's what we're going to be doing. Okay. Awesome. So, okay. Into Aurora. Yes. Okay. Uh, Rachel, before, before you begin, uh, yes. hide the, the stop sharing screen button at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. For better. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, dear. Hi. That's not, that's not <laughs> where I wanted to go. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So... Aurora. Yes. Okay, so Aurora is um, is related to activity on the sun. And there is a lot of different kinds of activity, but um, 
generally uh, what happens is there's particles released during solar storms and those particles travel in the form of solar winds through space. I think it's something like 91 million miles or something like that. Anyways, it's a very, very long time or very long distance. And when they reach Earth, they first come in contact with Earth's magnetic field. And our magnetic field, um, you can see from the diagram here, um, you can imagine that there's all these like little little lines that are like little, um, yeah, the field lines, they kind of like a slinky. Imagine a slinky that, that uh, surrounds the earth, but then nested slinkies because there's different levels of them. And the way that they talk about these sort of magnetic field lines, they'll call them L shells. Um, won't get too much into the science of that, but if you have a magnetic field line that is one earth's radii away from earth, that would be an L of one. And I think the maximum radii for uh, magnetic field lines is about 15 uh, away from Earth. So 15 Earth's radii, and that would be an L of 15. And in between those, you have infinite numbers of combinations. You can have L 6.123, you know, so there's, but you can imagine them as being, you know, um, closer or further away from the earth and then nested. So like a little slinky that surrounds the whole earth, but then nested together. And the reason why um, I am talking a little bit about that is because as you, um, as the solar wind travels and it, and it comes in contact with earth's magnetic field, first of all, um, those little particles that are coming from the sun, they're charged. And when they come in contact with our magnetic field, they kind of get pulled in. And you can imagine that like, um, like if you had little uh, metal filings and a magnet, um, you'll get an, an orientation as some get pulled one way and some get pulled another way. And so they get pulled into um, our magnetic field. And the first place that they enter is near the poles. And these are our, not our geographical north and south poles, but our magnetic north and south poles. And that's why we see aurora at high latitudes typically. Um, and uh, you can also see it in the Southern part of the world as well, but because um, the aurora naturally occurs where there's not a lot of inhabitants, um, we don't see as many photographs and stuff like that from the South, but it does definitely happen there. And so as the solar wind comes in, little little like we'll call them like baby storms they just sort of follow these outer magnetic field lines these l l shells of l15 l14 whatever but when the solar storms get really strong so when we have a big event like we've had over the last we've had several of them over the last few months it's been really exciting um what happens is the the solar wind is so strong that it actually pushes against earth's magnetic field and and it starts to like along, uh, they, they, it pushes and sort of elongates it. And then um, those L15, L14, they snap and they, and they go out and they get pushed out behind earth, like into a tail, like a comet, you get like a, the shape of a comet. And as those um, outer magnetic field lines snap, then you get um, aurora that comes lower and lower and lower towards the equator. Does that make sense? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, um, so when we have like small amounts of activity, you get um, the aurora is more concentrated around the poles, um, mm -hmm. specifically like you know Norway, Finland, Canada, um, there, uh, Iceland. You know these are all really good places to see aurora because you don't really need a big storm to happen to um, see it. You know more south. That doesn't mean you can't see it more south because when you get a big storm, like we had just a few weeks ago in April, I saw it in California, which is absolutely crazy to me. We had a, a really large storm. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, yeah, basically uh, what's happening here is we get these charged particles that come in, they follow the magnetic field lines. And then once they enter Earth's um, upper atmosphere, they start to interact with gases in the 
uh, in the atmosphere. So oxygen and nitrogen being the two top um, different types of or like the two main things that it interacts with. And that is, so that interaction or that reaction um, is what actually causes the aurora. So it's when the particles from the sun collide with and interact with the gases in our atmosphere. And if you were to look up in the sky at that time, if you see aurora overhead, you would see something like this. And that's just uh, like, billions of reactions with all of these different little particles reacting with different gases in our atmosphere. Wow. And so we can, we actually know um, what different types of gases produce different colors. And so if we're looking at nitrogen, for example, so nitrogen is in blue and purple there. And then you can see that up to 60 miles or 96.6 .6 kilometers from Earth, like up to that, um, uh, that level of the atmosphere, we'll probably see more blues. And then above that, you're going to see more purples. And that's the particles interacting with nitrogen. And then below that, so when it interacts with oxygen, um, this is going to be um, about 150 miles or 240 kilometers um, above Earth's horizon or whatever, you're going to get green. And um, even higher up, you're going to get red. And that's when it interacts with oxygen. Any Very questions? nice. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, and um, I just wanted to give a shout out to my daughter who actually made these infographics for me because she did such a beautiful job. And I'm so, I was like so thrilled with them. Um, and uh, you can find her online, inkandclaw.ca, uh, I think she is. Awesome. Should have, should have put that in there. Very okay. professional. So now that we know what an aurora is, how do we go find it? <laughs> and how do we shoot it? So, um, you know, we, we see a lot of pictures of Aurora and you're usually seeing that it's at night or sorry, it's, well, it's at night and it's, um, in the winter time. So, you know, uh, typically seen in the winter months. And why do you think that is? Night sky? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely night sky. Um, but in the winter months, because if you're thinking about our very northern latitudes, so mm -hmm. let's go back to Norway. I mentioned that's one of the places that you can see it very easily. Um, the winter time, they have very, very long nights. And in the summertime, they don't have any night. So if you're going to, if you're going to see Aurora, it has to be during the nighttime because otherwise the sun will sort of wash out, you know, it just washes it out. You don't get to see any of the lights. You can't see that reaction happening because the sun overpowers that um, illumination. So um, typically we think about it like a winter event because it's more associated with areas in the north and you're going to get longer winter nights. And in the summertime, you don't even have winter nights. So um, I was looking at the amount of light, for example, in, in Leknes, Norway. I was just there a little bit ago. And um, by March 31st, you don't actually get true nighttime anymore. You, you only see astronomical twilight. And then as you move into the summer, as you know, you're going to get um, the midnight sun. So the sun doesn't even set. And then the start of night happens around September 14th, where you get your first like hour of darkness. And so Aurora exists all the time. And we can like theoretically, we could see it at any time of the year, but it's more associated with wintertime because of the more northern latitudes um, that you can see it most easily at. <laughs> But you can also see it in places like that are a little bit more south. So Banff, I still consider fairly, fairly north, but um, we're at 51 degrees north here, not 68. And so we have a longer season for it. Um, we get to see it um, more. Uh, so our end of night here would be May 24th and the start of night would be July 20th. So we also have a period where you would only see darkness as much as astronomical twilight, but we don't have the midnight sun here. So you would have a minimum of astronomical twilight all night. 
And you can actually still photograph the Milky Way and the Aurora during astronomical twilight. Um, it just, again, because of the amount of relative light, you would need a bigger storm to be able to see that, you know, um, that, that reaction to see all the different colors. And the other cool thing about sort of mid-latitude shooting is that you get to see it with the Milky Way. So the core of the Milky Way doesn't rise above the horizon when you're in like more northern parts of the world, like Norway or Iceland um, and Finland, but you get to see that here in the Canadian Rockies. So um, yeah, I was, I was uh, photographing the Aurora in March and I was thinking about long-term um, this, the idea of this, you know, the return of this sunspot. And I was thinking about, okay, where would I go to go and shoot this if I like, if, if this comes around in April, which it did. Um, and I would, and in the end I realized, well, I would want to shoot it at home because by April there's no darkness in the more Northern parts of the world. So shooting at mid latitudes is ideal. Um, so really paying attention to, you know, what area that you're thinking about being and what are the chances of a, um, you know, the amount of nighttime skies that you have and the possibility of seeing it. So. Very cool. Very cool. So you, you can see the, the auroras in uh, August in uh, the Rockies. Yes, absolutely. Um, even in July, I had some friends right. visiting last year and we were able to see it in July. It was like, uh, I think it was like a low sort of KP4, KP5 level event. Mm -hmm. And um, it was still like, you know, big dancing pillars and stuff like that above the mountains. And um, it was really really beautiful. Nice. nice. Okay, so now that you know, find it, so to speak. Um, basically, anywhere you go in the world to shoot Aurora, depending on the size of the storm, generally, you want to be pointed north. And so this is a, a spot I was looking at in Norway, I used photo pills to just do you know, figure out where I was using the night AR. And I wasn't interested in the Milky Way. I just wanted to know what the alignment of the location was so that I knew kind of where to look for the Aurora. And um, and then, you know, you can pull out your pull out your compass or whatever as well. But if you're in a north facing location or um, yeah, a north facing location, you're more likely to see it um, at any level. As the storm grows, as it gets bigger and more uh, and more bright, it'll start moving in other directions. So I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, but as a general rule, you want to plan for a location that is facing north so that where you're looking north. Um, but that last one, this is looking southeast. And um, so even at mid latitudes, you can see the aurora in the southeast if the storm is strong enough. So the rest, basically, if they are strong enough, they can appear in any direction, right? Exactly. Yeah. So depending on your latitude. Um, in California, I think the only time I would see aurora in any direction is um, if it was a Carrington level event, which would <laughs> probably wipe out our um, like, like our grid. And uh, my son is an electrician, and um, we mm. were joking about you know what happens if it was a Carrington level event, which... I shouldn't get excited about, but like, okay. <laughs> anyways, um, and he was like, okay, so yeah, you'd have to ground your camera. And he was talking about a copper stake and, and he's like, I don't think your camera would, you, that you could actually do it. But anyway, it was a whole theoretical conversation on what would happen to my camera equipment during a Carrington level event. But um, yeah, so at different latitudes though, so mid latitudes, yeah, uh, for sure in the Rockies at 51 degrees. Um, higher, a little bit lower, depending on the level of the storm, you can see it. Um, so yeah. I'll talk about storm levels coming up here in a little bit, and I'll explain a little bit more about, you know, how far south they come as they as the storm levels grow. But first, I'll hop into how we actually know when we're going to get an aurora, and kind of how to read the different indicators. So that's what I have for you here on the screen. Um, I use an app called Space Weather Live. It is sort of my go-to. 
Actually, my go-to is often Twitter as well because <laughs> information gets released there first before it's updated. So yeah, I mean, if you're super nerdy about it and you're gonna follow it really closely, um, you, you need to be on Twitter. But um, Space Weather Live is a really great resource because um, you get to see what is real-time data. Um, also, they will give you predictions. So when you open it up, um, this image on the left is a screen capture of sort of the like the main page, the home page. And um, that one shows you KP index. And that's the one that most people are familiar with. Um, and it's basically a measure of the strength of the storm. It's a three hour average um, and it's a global average. So you can have little substorms that happen and um, that they can be stronger. Um, so KP is an interesting indicator because as a, as a mean, as an average, um, yeah, it's maybe not the best indicator. So I'm going to get into that, but I'll move on to what these other ones are. And then, um, so if you, that little bit in red there, if you click on the more data on the homepage, then you can get into these other uh, two things here. One is the sort of short-term forecast, what they expect in the next three days. That's the image on the right. And the other one is a long-term forecast. And that one will show you kind of maybe what's expected over the next month. That one you have to really take with a grain of salt because what they're basing that on is if you have an area of really high activity, so let's say um, a coronal hole, sometimes um, that coronal holes produce really, really fast solar winds and that often um, results in aurora for us. So a coronal hole can make more than one rotation. So as the sun rotates, we might see that again and again. And when you guys were here in February, um, we had the influence of a coronal hole. So that was a really fast solar wind. And then at the same time, we had an M-class flare. I think there might have actually been two. Um, but <laughs> so we had this M-class flare, which... Um, uh, flares in, in, in and of themselves don't produce that type of activity, but it came with a, what they call, call a coronal mass ejection. And that means that um, matter from the sun with all these particles, charged particles were hurtled through space towards Earth and they were traveling very, very fast. So sometimes those coronal holes can make more than one rotation. And that one did. That one that we saw February 26 into the 27th came back from March 23rd. And then on March 23rd, I was like, oh, do you think it could happen again? Like, do you think we could get this coronal hole again? And um, that same area of the sun, it wasn't a coronal hole, but we did see that same area come back in, in April on the 23rd. So it wasn't the coronal hole. It was actually um, a flare with a, a, an associated CME that that produce that activity, but that was a KP eight and a half, which is this, the scale only goes to nine. So it was a pretty big event. Um, and um, it came from the same general like vicinity. But um, so when it comes to these sort of long-term forecasts, when you see something like this, um, that's because if they had say a big coronal hole, there's a very good chance that that could come around again and you'd get you know, increased solar winds and stuff like that from that same spot. But they can also decay as they go around. So they can come around and then you like, then it's gone, right? And new things form all the time. So um, it's best to just sort of watch it and see. And the better indicators are these ones. So mm -hmm. this is like a, just a series of screenshots from the first, the first, like the home page. you can scroll up. And um, so again, here's our home page. And this will give you a projected KP forecast for um, like a minimum and a maximum. Um, and then I think it also will break it down into higher latitudes and, and mid latitudes. And I haven't looked at that in a while, so I shouldn't say that too loudly. I think that one might be for higher latitudes. But anyway, these ones here are useful at any latitude that you're at because, um, and by these ones, I mean these three, I'm like 
scrolling across with my mouse, but I have no idea if you can see my mouse. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, we see okay. it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, the first one there is the real time solar wind. And so at, when, the, when I did that little screen capture, um, we had solar winds of 462 kilometers per second, which is maybe elevated, but not super high. Um, uh, like that's almost, almost normal range. Density there is, um, so, uh, there was a, an impact of a CME and, uh, the wind speeds reached over 800 kilometers per second. Um, but we still didn't see Aurora or at least not much of it, not here. And the reason why we didn't see Aurora is because the polarity was wrong. Um, if you look on this third image here and you see this one thing called BZ, it's a measure of the polarity. So if you think about that, um, there's all the, these particles are traveling along magnetic field lines um, and then they interact with particles in the, in the gases in the atmosphere. The magnetic field lines all have their own um, polarity as well. Um, so it's like for us to get the right interaction and reaction um, to produce aurora, we need a south polarity. And last night we didn't have a south polarity, it stayed north. And so we had sort of low level um, storming that you would see, but it never, it never really got very big. So the, the indicators that are the most meaningful that help the most in, in a moment, like if you're online and you're like, should I go out or should I not go out? It's actually not the KP index that you wanna look at. And I'll keep returning to the KP index and why that's not a great indicator in the moment. Um, it can be, I mean, if, if it's updated and you, and you can see it's like high, then go out. But you'll see these other indicators first. So when the BZ drops and it stays south for a long period of time, like sustained south, then you get um, this uh, last graph here, the hemispheric power starts to build. These are the two number, like like number one and number two key indicators for me um, as to whether or not I should go out and shoot. A South BZ that is sustained and then increasing hemispheric power. And for me, I like to see that over 50 um, uh, gigawatts. And then this one here, just so that you know what it is, this is a uh, interplanetary magnetic field is kind of how high or how low the BZ can go. Um, and on this day, the, the maximum strength of it would have been five, which is very low. Um, so five, either north or south. And then this last one over here that I didn't talk about, this is the density of the solar wind. Um, so you can have fast solar winds or you can have dense solar winds or you can have fast and dense solar winds. Either one can produce aurora. But um, what I like to see when you see the arrival of a, of a CME, for example, you'll see that density spike. So I'll show you some more of this and I'll kind of talk through it. And then I can show you the images to match because I've taken a, an interest in um, collecting the data, like the real time data at the same time as I take an image or you know, within an hour, because sometimes I don't have service or, you know, we're celebrating too much and singing and dancing and whatever. So um, I have some stuff I can show you where I've actually taken pictures of the data and taken pictures of the actual event. And you can see what it looks like at different latitudes even. So questions so far? I feel like that was really heavy in the science. Uh, I think everybody is just paying attention and learning a lot. Uh, mm. I'm uh, learning a lot, so it's very interesting to okay. really understand all these uh, indexes that will make your life easier when deciding where if to go, where to go or not. Yeah, so, great plan. And so but, we'll yeah, I'll show you. Info. So this night that you're looking at here on the screen, this is um, when Photofels was visiting in February. And if you wait till the very, very end of this thing, and if you squint really, really hard, you can make out the Milky Way there. So mm -hmm. wait, watch for it. But this night, the Milky Way was so bright, at, or sorry, the Aurora was so bright, it washed out the Milky Way. 
So um, that's kind of cool. So what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about KP index and what it means and why I don't think it's a good indicator for going out um, at a particular given time um, in a moment. But so if you hear on the news, oh, we're expecting a KP7 or a KP8, go out, just, you know, just go out and shoot because I think that's a, a really high chance that you're actually going to see something. Um, and if you see them talk about, you know, last night's storm as having been a KP eight and a half, that's a measure of how big it was globally, uh, how, how intense the storm was, and it's a good indicator of what happened. So it's a good indicator of what might happen and what did happen. At the moment, it's like not the fastest indicator you can look for. So... Um, when we talk about KP, it's on a scale that ranges from um, zero, like nothing at all, to KP9. I think basically after a KP9, it's a Carrington level event. So that's just as high as the scale goes. Um, and um, the, the biggest I've ever seen is the eight and a half that I saw in April on the 23rd from California, which when you're looking from California, it's just these like little dancing pillars off to the north. And, you know, it's not like the surround experience that we had um, when mm -hmm. you were visiting, but still interesting to see it from the desert. So um, if you're up underneath the, um, the auroral zone or the auroral oval, so if you're in Iceland and Norway and all that stuff and, and it's winter time, you can see aurora, just even just a little green band, it's like a one. You can see it at any at any level because you're sitting right underneath the aurora oval. And the aurora oval is kind of interesting too. It's not exactly like the, um, uh, it's not like a concentric circle. It's, it's pulled and twisted by our magnetic field lines. So um, it kind of sits a little lopsided because it's, it's centered around your um, magnetic north pole. And then, so it looks like it, it just, it's not as, um, uh, I don't know, perfect as you might imagine it, like like perfect circle, if that makes sense. It's pulled and twisted by um, Earth's magnetism. So if you're sitting up underneath the aurora oval in like Norway or Iceland or something like that, um, you can see uh, an aurora at basically KP1. It might not be anything like super bright or whatever. You might have to take your camera out to see it, but it can exist at that level. Whereas if you're in the sub auroral zone, which is more like mid latitudes where I am, then um, you wouldn't see it at a KP1. Um, you're too far south and you have to look north to see it until it gets big enough that the oval expands down. Um, so as the storm grows in intensity, that oval will actually get bigger and bigger and bigger and just expand down like a, I think about it like an umbrella coming down. And interestingly, if you're in this region here, this open region, this is the polar cap, like you, you actually would have to look south to see Aurora because you don't see it there. Okay, so we start off with like, you know, um, if you were paying attention to a forecast you and you have this, they're showing you like green, it's going to be a KP0 to a KP4. It's not, not a very large event. At a KP4, so active, we can see it in the, in the middle latitudes, like in the Canadian Rockies, and it would appear like a, like a green glow on the horizon. And I have a picture a little later I can show you that shows that. Um, and then uh, KP5, you would start to see pillars that come out behind the mountains. If you were on the prairies, a KP5 would be like more like dancing ribbons because there's nothing to get in the way of the aurora. Like there's, you know, it doesn't have to get over a mountain or whatever um, for you to be able to see it. So, you know, it depends on, on where you are. And then by the time you hit six, um, the KP, or sorry, the, the aurora is swinging south. And so that little um, time lapse that I showed you uh, with the Milky Way, that was a KP6. And so you could just start to see the aurora coming in um, on the south, but it wasn't super strong. Um, it was more like, you know, little, little ribbons, little flashing dances of light. And that happened just in the, in the wee small hours of the morning before the sun came up. So I had maybe an hour 
or an hour or so with Aurora kind of coming slowly, a little bit creeping into the side of the frame. And that was the March event. So it was March 23rd that that happened. Um, and that one started actually like way earlier, um, started the kind of the morning of. So that was the morning of. And then I have more from later in the night. So the one that we were experiencing together, Rafa, that was a KP7. Mm -hmm. And yeah. by the time it hits KP7, you can see Aurora all around you and you don't know where to point the camera and it's super exciting and you're probably going to lose your mind a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty intense. And then the yeah. difference between that and a KP8 is really more like where you see it in the world, because if you were here in the Rockies, a KP8 would, would seem the same as a KP7, um, but that oval is going to keep expanding and so you'll see it down south and so it expanded all the way down into like more than just the northern states um it was seen in like i think you did you say it was seen in poland um yeah, and in spain spain and uh, mid spain uh, it, was, it was seen to see mm -hmm. yeah and california so yeah the difference between like a kp7 8 and 9 is actually more like where you get to see it because the Aurora Oval actually expands down. And if you, and it can expand away from those more Northern places like Norway and Iceland, it can expand so that you have to look South for it. So it's kind of an interesting thing, way to think about it, but generally it just um, gets bigger in the, in the size of the band um, and kind of stretches down over the planet as it gets bigger storm. And again, my daughter did this so pretty. <laughs> Beautiful. Inconclaw.ca, everybody. Um, she's a really wonderful artist. So that night, um, when we went out, this is our, so February 26th, um, let's talk about KP and some of the indicators. Um, you can see from my screenshots here, I was looking at the data at 4.31 p.m. Our day actually started at one o'clock when this storm arrived 12 full hours early. Um, we had absolute cloud mageddon over the Canadian Rockies. Like from, from Kananaskis to Jasper, the entire mountain range was just cloud and snow. And it's one o'clock in the afternoon, this thing's 12 hours early. I was really hoping it would be 12 hours late or you know, come the next day or whatever, because then we would have clear skies. But no, 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 this KP7 event of, of the season, you know, the biggest event that had happened up to that point in the winter season, um, was like going to come during full cloud Mageddon. So we're looking at the data at 431, and this is, you know, a few hours before it actually gets dark. It's already, it's, it's showing a KP5. Um, and there was chatter about how big the storm could be, but nobody really knew for sure. But I knew we wanted to be out shooting. And so when I'm looking at the other indicators, though, Solar wind speed was really like, that's strong. 627 is like really nice. The density was really nice at 20. That's like, you know, and I'm looking at these indicators and I'm thinking this is probably already bigger than a KP5. Um, but this little, um, so we get down here, the BZ, we call this a bouncy BZ. Uh, um, I also call it niggly because it's like, it's like a niggly line, you know, um, very technical term, niggly BZ. And um, because it was bouncy, that means that um, it would be really hard for us to see an aurora because it's the wrong polarity. And the BZ has to be sustained south for us to see a good aurora show. And if you look at this hemispheric power graph on the side, you can see that it was really small storm hits and it starts growing, 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 growing. It almost gets like really good. So it's reached like a hundred there. And then it starts to taper off and it starts to taper off because it went north. So um, when this hemispheric power tapers off, it's below 50. Again, it's like another indicator that we're looking for to see what we're going to see. So um, of course I'm like, I can't, I'm, I can't pry myself away from the, from the data. I'm on space weather live constantly. I'm messaging everybody. I know I'm trying to find a spot for us to shoot. Um, and this thing is just growing. So by 8.14 p.m., <laughs> notice how the KP hasn't changed yet. But look at these indicators, 6.75. Um, 
this is like probably a glitch in the matrix. Sometimes what happens when we get um, like a really strong storm is you, it can, one of the sensors will go down on the satellites or something like that. And so the density, I wouldn't believe that for a minute. Um, and the interplanetary magnetic field looked good. Uh, oh, and the BZ was south and then it, you know, it goes north again. And so this is the <laughs> agony of Aurora chasing because you're like, no, stay south. And, um, and you can see how high the hemispheric power got there as well. So 8.14 PM. Um, and I mean, we got there and it was cloud and, and I, I feel like I should have put the clouds in next, um, but I'm kind of on a, on a KP rant right now. So I'll, <laughs> I'll finish my KP story um, and then I'll show you kind of what, what we were facing when we got there. But anyway, when we got there, it was like fully clouded in and the whole group is like, they're hopeful, but I can see they're dejected. You know, they're like, okay, so yeah, this looks great for Aurora, you know? Um, <laughs> And by, by one o'clock in the morning, Raph was running around with his phone, taking phone pictures. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so this whole night was exciting for me because my sort of bucket list idea of a shot was we were out at Abraham Lake. Um, the bubbles weren't really great condition at that time, but you could see them underneath the ice. And so I'm pointing at this image here on the top right. Um, and you know, we we had this iconic Mount Michener. And so I left space for the Aurora kind of, um, this is looking south. And I I didn't care about any north facing look or, or location. I wanted Milky Way that night. So um, Carl and I set up right beside each other on these like little patch of bubbles. And this is a lake that's like 30 kilometers long, but uh, we, we tripod buddied. Um, and my hope was that I would get Aurora on one side and Milky Way on the other. Um, and the, yeah, so we got Aurora all night. This is, um, uncle Tony, I call him uncle Tony, Anthony's shot, Anthony Cladera, um, on his modified camera. You can just see that I think this is a pano that he panoed across and it's just a crazy, crazy amount of Aurora in every direction. Um, what a night, Rachel. What a night. I remember that night lying on the ice on Abraham Lake and just enjoyed the show for, I don't know, how many hours. 12 it hours. Of the entire night. It was the entire night. So, and that's also unusual for Aurora. You know, when you get a really strong storm, it can be prolonged like that. But, you know, by the time it gets dark and, you know, you find a clear sky and like, what are you actually going to see? Um, sometimes they don't last that long. And so you can get out there and get a couple of shots and then it's, and then it tapers off or it goes North, the BZ goes North and then you don't see anything. And so that night I'm just like, okay, you know, it was just hard to know where to find the camera. It was, it was that incident, um, and that, that crazy. Um, so here I'll move on. So this is 1.14 a.m. Um, I took this little screenshot of the data. You can see that it reached KP7 globally, but we got to see this long before it actually registered as a KP7. We were already looking at it in multiple directions before it registered that way. And so that's why I say KP is a good indicator of what happened on February 27th or what might happen tomorrow, but in the moment, it's not the best indicator for what to look at. Um, uh, for, you know, should I go out and shoot? You really actually just wanna look at these ones. And so after things sort of settled down, that BZ went south and it stayed south. Look at this, um, this third graph here. And you can see like minus 11 south, it stayed like that all night for 12 hours. We started seeing aurora during astronomical twilight and the next morning my my co-guide brian at astronomical twilight the next morning he's like rachel we have to like we have to leave it's we've we'd been out for like 27 hours or something like that like we left it i don't know what time we left that day four o'clock no one o'clock in the afternoon we were at the trailhead cafe getting food and yeah. then we drove two and a half hours out there. We were out there for, well, out sunset. It actually was a nice sunset once we got past the clouds. 
And then the the clouds came in again and everybody was like ready to vacate the ice. And all of a sudden I'm like, nope, Aurora, there's Aurora. <laughs> and so <laughs> we were all scrambling to get cameras and just, you know, get it, getting this little glimpse of the Aurora in between the clouds and then the sky opened up and it was absolutely nutty. So this was like sometime around just before Milky Way rise in the morning. So probably around 4.30 ish. Mm -hmm. And it's just mm -hmm. dancing all over the place. And I, when I so when I process this time lapse, um, the the snow here, I actually had to really tone this because when the aurora got really red and magenta like that, the entire foreground just turned purple, according to my camera. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. I've never seen a purple. I've never seen snow turn purple from reflected light before, but that's what happened. <laughs> so. Um, and then I had to announce to the entire group that the Milky Way was canceled due to excessive aurora, um, <laughs> which I've never had to do before. And uh, that was also extremely exciting, but also like slightly disappointing because I had one camera pointed at the same composition for the entire night, just just hoping that I would get the two of them together. But no, nope, it was just too bright. Um, so too nice. I made one of our one of our guests like uh, afterwards, he was just teasing me about, you know, not being able to get Milky Way. So he he edited one in for me, albeit <laughs> we have to work on his processing skills there. Um, My God, Jaime. Jaime's <laughs> gonna be with us in the camp too this year. I know, he, he messaged yeah. me the other day. Can't wait to, uh... excited. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see him. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, just share this with you because um, I think it's very, very, Cool and interesting, obviously get very excited about Aurora, um, but right now we're in solar cycle 25 and we are moving towards a period of solar maximum, which means that there is more areas on the sun that are active, angry, whatever. So um, this the solar cycles happen about every 11 years. Um, there's some variability to that, but basically what's happening is uh, there's like a polarity change um, which is very strange um, a concept to sort of wrap your head around. But as it goes through this 11 year cycle, you'll have, you'll have a period of solar minimum where there'll be very, very few sunspots. Um, and then solar maximum where they, there'll be more sunspots. Um, there's other ways that they measure activity as well. Um, sunspots being one, but um, flares being another and stuff like that. So you can have they measure C class, M class, X class flares. And for us, um, the predicted cycle was the red line. And what we're actually seeing in terms of activity is uh, the squiggly line. And you can see that we're sort of ramping up and, and having a much um, more active solar cycle this, this time around than, than they were forecasting. Um, so that's very exciting. And then the other thing is, that um, predictions for solar maximum are anywhere from middle of 2024 to middle of 2025 or into 2026. So over the next year or so, in the next year and a half, we're just gonna continue to have more and more of these like really um, more Aurora events and bigger events. And so you can see that like, you know, even if we're, we haven't reached solar maximum yet, um, we still have the really great activity. So even after solar maximum happens, there'll be another year or two where it kind of comes down on the other side and we still have really great activity. So um, first cool thing is we're moving into solar maximum. And, and if you've ever wanted to go and photograph the Aurora or, you know, plan an Aurora kind of trip, the next year and a half is your, is your window for sure. I mean, or the next, well, you know, going into solar maximum and coming out of solar maximum or is your window. And so it's a really exciting time to be out there shooting Aurora. Great oh, cool. and, oh, so the other cool thing that I should mention is that activity is actually stronger during your equinox periods. And it has to do with the angle of the, like the earth in relation to the sun. And um, it, it, during equinox, we get cracks in our geomagnetic field that allow more of that solar part, those sort of solar particles in. And so, we t typically have much stronger storms um, around equinox. And that's, it's not just like a particular date, it's the, the weeks leading in 
or like, you know, we had this big event in February that was four weeks before Equinox. And then there was another big event, um, March 23rd, which would have been right around Equinox. And then, um, and then another one in April. So it was actually, you know, it's, it's the weeks before and after, but they're very, very, Aurora is much stronger around the Equinox periods than it is throughout the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So another, another good tip for planning, like if you are planning a, an Aurora trip, for example, best to plan it around Equinox or in the weeks just before and just after. Yeah, but the truth is that it can happen uh, any yeah. any moment, any day, because we had it in February and it was a blast. Yeah, it's happening all of the time. Uh, yeah. It's just, uh, I guess if you, were, if you were looking more... Um, if you were in a more sort of, I guess, if we were closer to solar minimum, those mm -hmm. equinox periods would be, you know, a much higher chance of seeing Aurora. But right now we're just seeing it like a lot, a lot. Like we're still seeing it right now. Like there's a, the, the sun has been more active in the last week than I have seen it any month, you know, mm -hmm. in the last number of years. I think this is the most active month I've witnessed where, um, you know, we're getting, they're getting so many, um, you know, M and C class flares that they can't actually model everything. And then sometimes what happens is you get um, like a CME, a coronal mass ejection associated with these flares, and you'll get that one released towards Earth, and then you'll get another one that follows. And then something will happen in space where there's like a traffic jam or a, a redirect or something. And then we're expecting this like big event and then nothing happens because we have no data from the time that it leaves the sun until the time that it hits the satellite that's near Earth. So um, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. But um, right now, the, this is May and we're seeing like crazy amounts of activity. Um, so yeah, it's not that that um, that you can only see it during March or or during mm -hmm. September or during equinoxes. You're going to see it because we're moving into solar maximum for the next couple of years. It's just going to be um, ramping up in the number of storms that we see and how strong they are. Okay, so a little weather planning. Um, I'll show you some of the tools I use, and then we'll get into how to shoot this and um, what kind of gear to use and stuff like that. Great. Okay. So this is an actual screen capture from, uh, from our night out. Um, I wish I had taken a, a screen capture of Windy that showed the cloud map. I have something that resembles it on the next slide that um, you can see here that our forecast was, was pretty dim. Uh, it was looking like a lot of snow and, um, you know, kind of cloud. I was hunting for a spot. Like I said, it was cloud Mageddon through the entire Rockies, but Abraham Lake is sort of on the, on the east edge of the Rockies. And at the end of the lake is basically the end of the mountains. And be, if you can get out of the mountain region a little bit, then you typically have slightly different weather. But on that day, even the prairies were socked in. Like it was just an Alberta thing. Like it was just like, it was bad everywhere. And yet I found this like little potential hole over right over Abraham Lake. And I'm like, well, that would be kind of perfect. You know, like I'd love to be out at Abraham Lake to shoot Aurora. And it was funny because this, there was like um, the way the, the, the weather system, it was like snowing everywhere. And I mean, we got there, it was snowing. Um, I'll show you what it looked like when we got there, actually. So here's a forecast for Lake Louise. And this is kind of what the cloud map looked like. This is not from that day. But Abraham Lake is over here. And you could see that it was just sort of like on the edge of this, like everything in blue and green is precipitation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we were up against going out shooting. So we get there and it looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody was like, okay, maybe it'll clear off. But you could just tell like everybody was like, oh, I don't know about this. And um, and true to the, the forecast, it actually did clear off. But it would clear off. And then and in the early part of the evening, that system that was to the, I guess it would have been to the east of us because we were looking south. We'd, we'd just come in and, and it would start snowing. And so you'd get like snow on one side of the frame and Aurora just screaming Aurora on the other side of the frame. We got all of the conditions that night. And at one point we were, you know, the snow came in and 
at one point people were like napping, but um, <laughs> cause it just went on forever. Like 12 hours of Aurora, everybody was napping in the bus. Except for Jaime and me, <laughs> like Jaime didn't go to sleep either. So that night, and um, so for me to find this little gap in the clouds, I my, one of my favorite tools is Windy. Um, it's an app, and I think I have the pro version of it. But you can look at the clouds. You can look at highlight high level clouds, mid level clouds, low level clouds. Um, if it's snowmageddon, it's just clouds. Um, and uh, you can mark your favorite locations. So when you're looking at all my little hearts here, this is basically the entire mountain mm -hmm. range in the Rockies from Kananaskis all the way up to Jasper. And then there's a, a few little favorite spots I have um, that are in like, you know, further in Mount Assiniboine in BC and stuff like that. So Windy is really great because if you scrub through the timeline at the bottom, it'll kind of give you an idea of how the clouds are moving. And so instead of looking at, you know, a forecast for Lake Louise and a forecast for Jasper and a forecast for Nordig, which is on the other side of Abraham Lake, I can kind of look at this and I can get a sense of how the clouds are moving and where the opening might be. And then I can kind of dig further into the weather and look at more specifically weather for that location. And mountain weather is really notoriously difficult to predict. Um, I've actually taken courses on how to uh, navigate the weather here. And um, it's because our, our mountains actually create their own weather, right? So um, we have little microclimates. And so when you get to know an area, like I know where it's typically five degrees colder al along the Icefields Parkway or you know where I'm more likely to find clear skies in a, at a given time because I know the mountains really well. Um, but if you don't know the mountains, then you need all the tools you can get your hands on. And so my, my first uh, resource is Wendy. My second one is Spot WX. And so this is just a, a website and I can type in a search term like Abraham Lake. And then there's different models here. And so you get different resolutions of models. Um, this one is like a one kilometer resolution, two, two and a half kilometer resolution, um, two day, two day, three day. And so then I'll look at all of these and if they agree with each other. And so like, if I click on one of these, I get something that looks like this and I can look at the clouds and I can see, okay, um, is there, does this, does spot WX agree with windy? am I going to get an opening at Abraham Lake between 10 p.m. and, and 5 a.m. so I can shoot Aurora? And I will look at all of those different weather models. And then the last one that really helps in the mountains, and there's, you know, there's a ton of different weather apps out there, and different ones work in different places. Um, Windy, actually, if you click on the little hamburger and you scroll down, you can choose different weather um, weather models. So you can choose, I use the ECMWF in the mountains. Um, it's a European model. And then there's the GFS, which is what a lot of, um, it's a free model. Um, and it's what a lot of like apps and stuff will use to give you a weather update. So you can look at the different ones, but um, for my area, the ECMWF works much better. So then I can go and look at a specific mountain even. Um, and so on mountainweather.com, I can go and I can look up a given mountain and then it'll show me the elevation. So I can see what's happening with the weather at the base of the mountain, mid mountain and at the top of the mountain. And that's especially useful if you're hiking or climbing or anything like that. But it's also really useful if you just kind of want to get a better sense of what's going on mm -hmm. very locally, you know, <laughs> at, a, at a particular mountain. So <laughs> questions on on the weather part of it? I have a uh, few questions on, on the, the whole planning thing and the, and the indicators. Uh, for example, uh, right, uh, these tools seem uh, they're real time tool tools. Uh, any uh, predictive measure, say 36 hours in advance that can help guide plans. So all these predictions are uh, real time, but also uh, they can be predicted. They predict for the the week or three four days in a, ahead of time. Too. These ones. Um, so these particular predictors. Yes. Okay. 
Um, okay. So no, they're not very good. Like three days ahead of time, um, mm -hmm. or anything like that. They can be like, so you guys know how disappointing it is when you tune into the weather and they're like, it's going to be sunny today. And you're like, I'm going to go and shoot the Milky Way. And I'm going to have clear skies. And then it snows. I mean, I've had this experience where I've looked at the weather and they're like, yeah, it's going to be clear skies. And then you're out there and it's snowmageddon. And you're like, how did you get it that wrong? You know, um, I've literally got screenshots where it says the forecast is for clear skies and I'm looking at the actual conditions and it's like, you know, full on cloud. So if weather is that difficult to predict, imagine yeah. how difficult it is to predict space weather. Space weather, we only really have two data points, the imagery when it leaves the sun and then when it hits the satellite that's near Earth. So when they, when they get the imagery, they can usually get a sense of how fast something is traveling. Sometimes they can analyze the polarity of say a coronal mass ejection flux rope. Like I don't want to get into that part of it, but um, cause it's definitely not something that's usually reported, but they can kind of get a sense, but then there's all this stuff that happens in space and be, and that makes it really hard to predict what's going on. And when you have multiple events, things going off all at the same time, you don't know how those things are interacting in space or how they're like changing the trajectory of the, the previous flare or, you know, how something's going to land just because we don't have any data points between the sun mm -hmm. and the satellite. So space weather is really, really difficult to predict, even though some of the most brilliant minds are on it. You know, I, I watch, um, well, I'll give you some resources at the end for people that I like to follow and tune into to learn more about it. And, um, it's absolutely mind blowing, like kind of what, what data they're working with and, and how much, how much they can predict. But at the same time, there's a lot, we don't even know about space mm -hmm. weather and about Aurora and stuff like that. And so I guess the, the long and the short of it is they can see something, they can see when something's launched. Like we've had just like multiple events, like I said, over the last little while. To predict what's going to happen when those events arrive at Earth is a whole different story. And mm -hmm. to predict what happens between point A and point B, our only two points of measurement, mm -hmm. is another story. And so if you see something, okay, so first of all, the news is not, the, the news is the killer of all things Aurora. There's like a joke among chasers, you know, like if it hits the news, it's not going to happen. Um, for whatever reason, it's it's not real, but it feels real. Um, but anyway, actually, I've decided that the number one predictor of when an aurora is going to happen is whether or not I have a photo pills presentation the next day. Um, <laughs> I was trying to wrap up this earlier, but um, last November when I did a, a presentation for him, we had a big forecast. It was like expected to hit KP8. And I was out until about midnight. And I'm like, OK, it's not here yet. It's a little bit cloudy. You know, do I do the responsible thing and go home and sleep so I'm coherent at 11 a.m.? Or do I, you know, go out all night chasing and then try to explain, you know, something technical during a talk and then whatever? I actually chose the grown up route and I regretted it ever since. And so when we got to go out in February and we got to see this thing go off for like 12 hours, I'm like, okay, Rafa, like we're redeemed now, right? Like, yeah, I made it up. Yeah. Um, but then last night we had another, like, we had a series of solar storms and there was chatter last night that it was going to hit KP8 again. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, <laughs> do I have to make this choice again? And um, so here in Alberta, it's been raining and the rain is much needed because we're, the province is on fire. Like we've had mm -hmm. uncontrollable wildfires. And so last night, like listening to the rain, I was like, it's okay if I miss it because it's raining <laughs> like and mm -hmm. we and I can't be out all the time but it was just funny so yeah if you guys want to actually know when the aurora is going to happen it's probably the, the night before I have to present for wrap up <laughs> that's, that's cool here. but yeah I mean present predicting aurora is really not an easy thing for people who have degrees in solar physics you know mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of a crazy thing to think about yeah, uh, Rachel, we have uh, two more questions, very quick. Uh, one that you mentioned the fires. So, yeah. uh, Gord Tomlin is uh, what are 
we are having uh, hazy skies in Ontario due to smoke from Alberta fires. How much would that impact aurora photography? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to impact it just like it's going to impact your Milky Way, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be a little, depending on how thick the smoke is, um, it's going to be a it's almost like putting on a filter or putting on sunglasses yeah. for your camera and um, mm -hmm. it will reduce the amount of detail that you can see. Um, you know, it, it, that's hard to say because it really depends on how thick the smoke is. Um, yeah. you know, here it's actually not that thick where I am. Um, even though Banff has just been inundated with fire in the last few weeks, I don't know what they're, how they're doing today, but it's been pretty bad. Um, I'm about an hour from BAMP at the moment. And um, yeah, I mean, I've been out during wildfire season and trying to photograph the Milky Way. And I, I use that dehaze slider a lot to try and mm. bring back some of the detail, but it's it's definitely not as, as good as if you're out in a clear sky. Okay, thank you. And the last one from Brad Perry. Is there any pattern to the rotation of the oval? I often noticed it, it, it weighted towards Asia earlier in the day and then weighted towards Canada late at night. Uh, is that a coincidence? Or... Um, okay, so I'm um, actually, it's a kind of a cool question. So I'm going to flip back to that, that chart like way at the beginning, um, just so I mm -hmm. can explain a little bit of what goes on. Um, too much flipping. Okay, it's a little bit of flipping. <laughs> But this one right here. So um, when, okay, so we got these particles coming in, um, you know, traveling on the, at the, basically the, the magnetic poles, right? Um, when we get a big storm, the, and those magnetic field lines start to split and, and they peel back, kind of like layers of an onion, they peel back and then they, they form this tail. The tail comes out like a comet. And when they meet again, there's a there's an X point. And that's when they connect um, magnetic and they reform. And um, but anyway, so in the process, so these these magnetic field lines get pushed back like the tail of a comet and they stretch and stretch and stretch like a rubber band until there's so much tension on them. Um, that they that they meet and they snap back. But in, anyway, as they're stretching, as they're stretching out and they come back, um, there's nowhere for these solar particles to go but to travel along the field lines and they actually get snapped back. A lot of our aurora during a big storm actually comes from this tail out, you know, out to the side, like on the night side of the of the planet. And so the large majority of the particles are coming in from the night side. Mm -hmm. So obviously, so you're not going to see anything on the day side because the sun is too bright, and then it's coming in. It's like coming in from the night side um, as these tra these particles travel. So the um, what are they called? Elfin waves when the when the um, yeah hard to explain. But anyway, so th these particles, they get really accelerated as they snap, uh, as, the, as the magnetic field lines snap, and then they travel back towards Earth, and they're very excited. Um, and so when you think about the aurora oval, then, and the where and where the aurora is, it has to do with the night side of the Earth, because even though it's happening on the day side as well, the, the effect is stronger on the night side. Um, and on the day side, we're not going to see it. So that Aurora Oval, when you see those pictures of it in the, uh, when you're looking on space weather, like these, this Aurora Oval here, you know, you can see, you know, it looks like the, the most of the activity at this time was um, coming on the Eastern side of Canada. And at 4.32 PM on February 26, it was probably quite dark there and probably, you know, light on the other side of the planet. So um, the Aurora Oval is moving with the, with mm -hmm. the dark. Mm -hmm. Does that make some sense? Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Time to shoot Auroras. <laughs> OK. All right, so let's talk about gear. Um, so that night with uh, photo pills, I, you know, I, I had two tripods with me. I didn't expect to shoot two tripods or three, um, but I had two cameras with me, and I really regretted not having an extra tripod. I did end up finding like a little, a little um, 
just like a little tiny like baby thing like a little uh, you know long legs or whatever to put camera number three on but i did shoot with three cameras um and so my cameras that i i mean i only have three cameras but um they all shot that night so i had the sony a7s3 the sony a1 and the sony a7 IV. and the a7 IV has been modified for astro which means that there's um, it lets in the visible spectrum of light plus the H alpha spectrum, which is really good for photographing nebulosity in constellations like Orion or some of the extra nebulosity that's in the Milky Way, for example. Um, and those two cameras, um, be, so the A7S III and the A7 IV, being a little lower on the megapixel side, they're actually much better for taking aurora photos because they ha they're, they're better in low light, like they, they have less noise. So even though my S3 is only 12 megapixels, um, it's a, a, a low light monster. I can have Diff completely different settings on the S3 than I have at the A1 on the A1 because I can let in more light and because there's less noise. Um, the A7 IV performs really similar to the A7S3. Um, it, even though it's 33 megapixels, it's a very, very good camera in low light. And then the A1, like, I don't know, when you get a storm that's really big, any, cam <laughs> any camera will do. Like, as you saw, you were like shooting with your iPhone. So, um, it, yeah, basically you can shoot any camera, um, yeah. the, the quality of the image is going to differ based on, you know, kind of how many megapixels you have, what the resolution is, because the higher the resolution, the more megapixels you have on the same size of sensor. And so the, the megapixels are smaller and they gather less light. Whereas if you have less of them, they're larger and they gather more light. And that means you have less noise. That's kind of the... The, I don't know, Cole's notes version of that. Um, there's mm -hmm. other factors that, that come into play there. But. And then in terms of lenses, you want something that's going to shoot really, like it's going to let in a lot of light. So we call that a fast lens. Um, so a fast lens is anything that is um, an f2.8 aperture or, um, or wider. So um, I mean... Ideally, you would have something that was like an f1.2 or 1.4 or something, but also really wide. Um, it's hard because you have to you have to choose. Um, a lot of the time, our really wide lenses don't go; they're not as fast. So, my favorite ones for shooting um, aurora are my Sony 14 millimeter GM. It's an f1.8, so that means it's going to let in a lot of light, and that means I can take shorter shutters. I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. settings in the in the next section here but um yeah it's going to let in lots of light and then the other thing is so one of the questions that came in on social media um was you know choosing how is choosing a lens for aurora different than choosing a lens for milky way and it actually is for me um so that whole conversation about um having more night sky in your frame Typically, if it's just Milky Way, I want to balance the Milky Way just, just the way that I would balance a sunrise or a sunset with my landscape. I want the Milky Way to be a complement to whatever it is that I'm shooting. I want to give a sense of, of moment to a place that I'm in. And um, so I don't necessarily, if my landscape requires a, maybe a 20 millimeter lens or a 20 millimeter focal length, then I don't want to go shoot really wide because then my landscape can get really small and lost in that scene. But with Aurora, it's a little different. So with Aurora, you actually do want that, that really wide field of view because um, the Aurora is like so crazy in, in the shapes and everything that it makes. Um, if you're too focused into something near the horizon, you're going to miss probably the best things that are that are happening around you. So you want to be able to get that landscape in there. You want to say, well, you can go out and shoot the Aurora anywhere, but to know that you're in the Canadian Rockies or that to know that you're in Norway or Iceland, you want to include the beautiful mountains that are there. So you really want to shoot with something really wide so that you can get both the landscape and a good portion of the sky. Um, just so that you can see everything. So I do choose my lenses a little differently than I would for Milky Way. 
um, because the Aurora displays tend to be so um, panoramic 360, you know, it's, it's harder to plan an Aurora shot or hard to plan a landscape with an Aurora when the Aurora is moving all the time. And um, yeah, the wider, the wider your field of view, the more of that dy dynamic movement you're gonna be able to capture. Whereas if you're kind of more focused in on just the landscape, you might just get a tiny little ribbon coming down and that would be it. You know, sometimes you gotta have that wider field of view to get more of the, of the action of the Aurora. Any questions on that? Any gear questions? No. You guys have no more gear questions. questions. Um, gear questions. Uh... I brought one thing to just show you guys. And I talk about these like pretty much every presentation. So please don't tune out if you've heard me talk about these before. But because Aurora is like largely a winter thing, you really want good gloves. And these are the ones that I have. These are made by the Heat Company. Um, they have a liner on the inside with touchscreen fingers, although if it's really cold, it's still hard to use. Um, and they're bulky and they are like, it takes some time to get used to. Um, but then they have this mitten on the outside that is um, windproof and you can put like a chemical warmer in there. And really, you know, the only thing, I think one of the worst things that you can do going out to shoot Aurora would be to not be prepared with your body because it's not worth frostbite, right? Um, nobody wants that. Um, so being out there, being warm and being prepared for yourself, um, you know, that you're going to be comfortable um, means you're going to be able to enjoy it much, much longer. Um, so having really good warm gear if you're going out to shoot in the winter. Of course, you could be shooting Aurora in the Rockies in the summertime and you won't need these big mittens. But um, they're, they're my number one piece of recommended gear for shooting in the Rockies, for shooting in Norway, for shooting in Iceland, any any climate actually unless it's more time perfect perfect rachel uh Dennis gunter is asking uh if a fish eye lens would be useful okay so i don't shoot with fish eye um it's just like a the curvature of it um i have seen some cool fish eye stuff though so um i mean try it out it's it's always worth a try um but it will sort of distort everything and kind of make it look like a bowl um but it could be interesting to try it. I think um, my recommendation would be to get a wide lens like the 14 or even the 12 and pano, you know, take panos where you can. Um, I loved Uncle Tony's pano, Anthony Fodera's <laughs> pano. Um, I did pano that night, but I panoed in the earlier part of the night when, you know, we were all like screaming, celebrating because it was like moving and dancing and everything. We had no idea how big and how crazy it was going to get. And then when it got as crazy as it did, I didn't pano later in the night. So I kind of regret not not pulling it out for a pano. But um, that's how I would <laughs> approach trying to get more of the sky. Be like Uncle Tony. I mean, uh, there was so much excitement around. And, uh, you know, you had to act fast. So uh, you got the best. I really love your images and the time lapses you got for that, for that night. So they are really top notch. Yeah, it was yeah, so much fun, such good memories. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Rachel, as promised, we have two more questions now in uh, regarding okay. gear. If you don't okay. mind, before we, we go to settings, yeah, yeah. Uh, what type of footwear do you recommend for winter aurora, which is very important? <laughs> I okay. <can't> recall. <laughs> Um, yeah, warm. So depending on the climate, again, um, if you were in Norway, you would really want something waterproof because you're, you know, on a lot of beaches and stuff. Here in the Rockies, we have more of a dry cold. And so I like the, um, the ones that are like fur lined or, you know, insulated really, really well. And um, something breathable because so the important thing when in really cold temperatures, which I didn't find Norway to be that cold. Um, I mean, it was windy and cold, so a different kind of cold. But if you get really cold temperatures and your and your feet or your hands sweat, like let's say you're in the car and you get sweaty feet mm -hmm. and you're because you're traveling, and then you get out and it's really cold, then the it's that sweat that's going to um, cause you temperature problems because you're going to lose heat more quickly um, in the in any areas that are wet. 
So with wet or touching your cold camera or your tripod or whatever, um, that's how you're going to, that's how you're going to lose heat through conduction. Um, and uh, so here we, you, you want something um, when you're out anyway to be very insulated. I, I think it's funny that I've been on a boot search for like five years and I finally found a pair this year that I really like. Ironically, they're Uggs. Um, and I feel kind of embarrassed saying that because I know when most of you picture an Ugg, you're going to picture like the, the slipper. <laughs> it's not the slipper. They're lace up, they're proper lace up boots, but they, um, I did a bunch of research and there was a, I can't remember what the website was, but they compared the warmth uh, ratings and, you know, they went out and tested different boots at different temperatures. And this Ugg Adirondack boot came in as like one of the top rated boots for women. And because I'm such a baby about the cold, I like, you know, I, of course I had to try them. Um, and they did really good, like, you know, in temperatures of minus 25 or, or whatever Celsius, um, they, my feet were, you know, not long. Like if I was out for a super long period of time, then I would get cold. I can put chemical warmers in there, but they were probably the warmer boots that I've tried. And I've tried Sorrel's, I've tried Baffin's, I've tried, and I mean, like I've tried this boot from Baffin and that boot from Sorrel, but you know, it's not like mm -hmm. I've tried a boot, um, but I do go through a lot. And um, so far I've been most happy with the Uggs. So they're called mm -hmm. the Ugg Adirondack and I really like them. Um, if you go onto my website, there's a, I have a blog article on preparing for like what gear to bring on a, on a winter workshop. And the, there's links to the gloves, there's links to the boots, there's links to all the stuff that I recommend. Perfect, perfect. Now I have like a ton of questions on gear. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should finish the, the shooting and then we at the end we can answer all okay. the questions together. No worries, I ha my day is yours. So however long you wanna spend. Okay, so um, so what I'm going to talk about for settings is I'm going to give you a guide for shooting the sky. And when I go out to shoot the, the night sky, I always shoot the ground separately from the sky, and then I combine those together. Because if you're trying to do it all in one shot, there's very, very few times when that's going to work out for you. Um, with the sky, we want to have a really, we want to have a short enough exposure that our stars are not going to be trailing. And depending on your camera and, and your aperture, your focal length, that's, that can be very short. Um, so when I, so if we just take out Aurora and we say, I'm just going to go out and shoot the stars, I shoot the sky separate from the ground. From, for the ground, I'll do longer exposures. I'll do a blue hour blend. I'll do um, th there's a bunch of different techniques you can use. And I don't think today is the day to get into those specifics. So I'm going to talk to you about shooting the sky and then we can make a part two if you want, but, um, shooting the sky. So my guideline for that is that we want to expose for the stars. And then from there, we want to adjust for the Aurora. And so what I mean by that is we're going to start off with a nice wide open aperture. So here's our, our first of three parameters, like our three main parameters for controlling light are the aperture shutter and ISO. And to get the stars nice and, and sharp, we want to make, and, and to let enough light into the camera, we're out there shooting at night, we are going to have to be shooting at wide open apertures. So our first parameter is set. We're going to be at f2.8 or wider. Um, you can shoot the night sky at f4, but it, it's going to be very noisy. you you're probably not going to be happy with the results. So try to go 2.8 or wider. Then the next thing is what shutter speed do you use? So if you've shot the night sky before, if you've shot Milky Way, um, perhaps you've used Photopill's um, pill called Spot Stars. And this pill, I'm going to flip to that page right now. So if you go into pills in the middle and then you find Spot Stars, you can get... Um, a screen that looks like the one in the middle. And so you can tap on where, where it says Sony a7S III. You can tap on that and you can enter your specific camera in there. And then you can put in your focal length and your aperture. And it's going to give you a couple of different readouts. So the first one here is, it says default. And um, we could leave our shutter open 
on the Sony A7F III at 12 millimeters f2.8 for 27 seconds. And when we do that, we're going to get minimal star trailing. So it would be the kind of thing that if you posted it on social media, probably nobody would see the star trails um, because their screen's so small. But if you were going to print it, then you would see the star trails. So if you wanted to be a little bit more exact, you would take this, this other number. So if you tap on default, you will get the screen that says accurate. And generally it's half the time. So my 13 or sorry, 27 seconds went down to 13 and a half seconds roughly. So if I wanted stars that don't move, 13 and a half seconds is where I need to aim for. Mm -hmm. so that's where I start with um, trying to find my shutter speed. Um, and if you were to use a different camera, that's gonna look different. So my A1 with a 12 millimeter at f2.8, my default settings, a little bit of trailing would be 17 seconds, but on for accurate to not have any movement at all in those stars, I would be down to eight seconds. So you can see there's a really big difference between your camera because of our, each camera has a different sensor. Um, focal length and aperture play a role in there as well. Um, so how long you leave the shutter open for, I'm going to start with my settings for, um, for stars. So if I was going to the Milky Way, I would choose the accurate setting, camera, focal length, and aperture. And that's where I would start. But Aurora is a little bit special, right? So when Aurora gets really moving and dancing, if you were to leave your shutter open for eight seconds, what you're probably going to end up with is a big green smear across the, across the frame. You're not going to have the details in it because um, it'll move and dance and, and in a long exposure, it'll just look like one long green smudge. So I start with that shutter speed for the stars. I want to make sure that my stars are sharp and that they're accurate so that they're nice little dots in the sky, because I know if my stars aren't nice, I'm going to be so sad. Um, <laughs> and then I'm, I work my way down from there. So if the, if the Aurora starts really moving and I'm at say eight seconds at 12 millimeters on my A1, now I know that I'm going to have to back the seconds down. I'm going to have to back the shutter time down so that I can capture that movement. Otherwise, it's just going to be a blob and I won't see the movement in the frame. Is that making sense so far? Yes, yes, 100%. Okay. And so then the last thing, the, the only other parameter I actually need to worry about is the ISO. And so as the Aurora, we're going to use the ISO to balance out the exposure because we know what our aperture is going to be. It's just going to be wide. And then we know what the shutter speed is going to be because we're going to start with PhotoPill spot stars, accurate. And then we're going to bring that shutter speed down as the Aurora moves to make sure we can capture the movement. And then just the last thing is to balance out the exposure with the ISO. And by balance out the exposure, I do not mean the entire image because I know I have to shoot the ground separately. I mean, I want to I want to um, expose for the sky. And so if I see any like really bright yellow or white um, highlighting in the Aurora, then I've I've overexposed it and and I can't recover those details. So I don't want to blow out my highlights. Um, and if it's really underexposed, you're probably going to be disappointed in the image as well. Exposure is a little bit tough when it comes to the night sky because it's harder for us to rely on our histograms. Um, the camera has a really hard time reading the light at night. And also the camera is going to look at the entire scene. So it's going to see all that black stuff in front of the mountain and this, you know, really reflective area of snow and the sky. And it's trying to make sense of that. So it's going to tell you on your histogram that you're underexposed. But are you underexposed for the whole shot? Or are you underexposed for the mountain? Or what part of the image is underexposed? Because you, you're not going to be able to get it all in one shot. Especially when you think about, um, my camera is nice and low to the ground here, so I can get all these these ripples in the in the ice with the snow trapped in these little ridges. And um, so for that, I had to focus stack that, um, which is you know getting into the shooting of the ground. But we have to treat the ground separately from the sky. So when I say you want to balance out your exposure, you want to balance it for the sky. Great. Okay. And then 
Um, when you're focusing, you're going to want to be manually focusing on the stars. Um, autofocus does not work at night <laughs> on any camera that I've seen. I know that some cameras suggest that they might be able to autofocus on a star, but I have not seen that work in, in practice. So um, even though people have brought those cameras on workshops, um, we always end up having to fine tune it. So um, yeah, focusing is something that you know can be a little bit of a struggle if you're not out there shooting a lot. And then white balance, if you're shooting in raw, it really doesn't matter um, because you can, you know, you can play with it. But I have a friend who um, in at Epson and uh, he has the analogy that it's a really big color space to wander around in. So the closer you can get it in camera, the better. And for that, I like to use a cool tone. Um, so you can use a custom cool tone, uh, typically around 4300 Kelvin. Um, on a Sony camera, it's the fluorescent zero or minus one um, works really well to kind of get the colors that you see on the right. Mm -hmm. Fantastico. Fantastico. Yeah. Any, any questions on like any of the settings? Um, so yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Lay it on me. What we got? <laughs> we have Rob, uh, mm -hmm. who's going to be in the camp also. Uh, Awesome. Next week, awesome. uh, you already know him. I don't know, you don't know him, uh, he couldn't come last year. Okay, okay. with your experience, what metering uh, would you use when exposing for the sky? So, again, like going back to metering, I, I just leave it in evaluative, but at the same time, I don't actually pay attention to the histogram very much or the metering very much unless it says I'm overexposed. Um, so I use it as one resource, but I, it's not something you can rely on because at night, the camera is going to read the scene a lot differently than it's going to read it during the day when there's light on everything. Um, there's just a much larger uh, dynamic range. Like when you have areas of absolute blackness and then you have really bright things like the Aurora, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot harder to do that. So I would leave it on like evaluative metering. Um, but I kind of just look at the sky and try to determine if the if there's anything overexposed in the aurora, and hopefully there's nothing you know too hot. Like you don't want to see any bright yellow or white anywhere. Um, white is only uh, so there is times when you'll see what white. Um, I should back up a little bit, but hopefully you know the the difference between like a white blotch and then something that actually looks white. So let me clarify that. I'm going to go to that shot, but I have a time lapse of that somewhere. Um, anyway, in this shot, and I have a time lapse of it somewhere, you can see that there's almost like a little bit of white here. That's not overexposure. That's where the colors mix together. So when you have a really intense storm, sometimes you'll see things that look like white light. And that's actually just because you've got the nitrogens and the oxygens all reacting in the same space and you get green and blue and all these colors mix and then you end up with white. Um, and so I've seen that in my images, but that's different than say a hot white or, you know, yellow white spot in the Aurora. So kind of hard to explain without a good example. I should actually just have like an overexposed thing in here. So here's another spot where you can see some white, but that's the mixing of colors. It's not too hot right there. Um, okay. Was there another question about settings? Yes. Uh, J-Man, uh, how many shots or focus stacks do you have to take the uh, for a picture like this demo? Uh, I mean, from the photo you have on the side, how many, how many shots or focus stack do you have okay, to take? So not to get into foreground too much, but I shot this foreground during the Aurora when the Aurora was a little quieter. F11, mm -hmm. ISO 5000, I think, and 30 second exposures. And there'd be five stacks at F11, given my um, the height of my camera and, the, and how close I was to my foreground from five stacks from foreground to mountain. Mm -hmm. And was the moon there? I think uh, at the beginning of the night, we had a bit of moon, right? Yeah, we had like 30 or 40% moon at the beginning of the night and Wait. by morning the moon was gone. So by morning there was no moon in this shot, um, but there might have been moon in this one. No, mm -hmm. that was also morning. So no. 
no moon. Okay, perfect. Okay, so okay. I had mentioned before that, um, so I have these two side-by-sides here. Um, this image on the right, uh, this was in January. We had a, a, you know, we were out and we were not really expecting Aurora, but then there were some, yeah, actually we were, we kind of knew that there, there may be some Aurora that night, um, but nothing big. And so this is like a KP4 um, in the mountains. You can see that it's a, it's a nice glow on the horizon and you can see some of that red on top. It's nothing like the, you know, the <laughs> dancing, moving stuff that you see over here, but you could still see it. And so this night we had gone out to shoot, um, Orion and um, Orion actually, you know, rose on this side of the mountain and then it travels up and was, you know, kind of sitting on top for a while. And, and so this is after Orion had moved out of the frame. And I was trying to tell my group, like, don't move because it still looks like we're going to get Aurora. And I had one fellow um, who looked at the data and he's like, oh, KP3, we're not going to see anything. And I'm like, no, no, don't, don't pack up because the data actually looks like it's moving in the right direction. We're just waiting for a South BZ. And so he packed up and he, he went to the shoreline and he was not at his composition anymore. And yeah, I, I, I think he still ended up shooting it. He just didn't have, you know, all that, all the stuff to work with that he would have, if he'd stayed in at his composition where he'd done a blue hour shot and, you know, focus stacked in the nighttime and stuff like that. So Anyways, um, this is like a KP4 event. This is a KP7, and they're both at the same location. You know, one was January, one was February. So you can kind of get a sense of what that wow. could look like. And the difference with the reflection here, if you're noticing that, is this was super clean ice in January where we had no snow. And so the light just, you know, uh, yeah. it was easy for the light to reflect on um, this image. Um, there is light out there on that, but we had light in every direction. And so it, here, the light was only coming from one, one spot, whereas this one, the light was from everywhere. So it was sort of in that moment, like very bright everywhere. Um, there is a little bit of, you know, a little bit of light on the mountain. You can see the green, there's a little bit of light here. And, uh, actually I probably, I toned down the light on the mountain cause it was really distracting. Um, but uh, yeah, so you might get something that looks really reflective like that. But this one, there was snow and my camera was really low. So it's just a different different shot. And then there was light all the way around. So um, if we were on a more reflective surface, this would have been like mirrored in here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. What a night we had, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a night, right? Pretty crazy. I should have brought my tripod. I need to buy a tripod for my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> oh my goodness. That was the best. I was like, I couldn't believe that you were getting like these really bright shots with your iPhone. That's nuts. <laughs> okay, we have a, a few questions on, on gear. You want to cover them now or you want yeah. to finish first the yeah. last slide? Um, so... Yeah, this is this is near the end. I'll I'll say a couple little comments here. Good. So this was on a moonlit night in Norway. Um you can see the different shadows here cast by the moon. But um, the, I, I, I included this photo because I think it's really pretty and it's a really, uh, I, I want to encourage you to not, to not, go, or not miss out on shooting because there's a, a moon. Um, mm -hmm. I think the moon can really add to the shot and make it even better because you can see so much more of the, of the foreground elements. Wow. Whereas, you know, here you got some pretty dark shadowy spaces and here you can see all of the details all the way back, like, through every detail of the mountain. So never be afraid to go and shoot during moonlight. And um, as promised, I wanted to also leave you guys with some resources for um, either being able to get that updated weather data, um, people to follow. I, I just am enamored with uh, Dr. Tamitha Skov. She's a space weather physicist. And she, so you can find her on Twitter, but she does, um, she, she'll post forecasts as well. Um, I follow her on Patreon. If you're a Patreon person, um, she'll give you sort of uh, more quick updates on what's going on. Um, so she updates her Patreon community and then she'll put it out to YouTube, you know, a day later or whatever. Um, and then there's lots of different Aurora Chasers groups you can follow. Um, there's 
one in Alberta here that's really big. Um, it's called the Alberta Aurora, Aurora Chasers. And um, they have a huge community of people from all over the world. So it's pretty cool. And then there's some really smart people on there that are, are that are analyzing data and they're, you know, solar physicists or space, you know, that they're more experts in the field. And, um, and so they're very good at directing people on, you know, when is a good night to go out and shoot if you have clear skies and stuff like that. So these would be my top three recommendations for um, resources. Great. Fantastic. Okay. And then my last, my last slide, I'm just going to leave oh, you with yeah. this one, <laughs> is that the, the Hills team, we're, we're coming back. We're going to do it again, uh, November 12th to 18th. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we're going to be staying here at the Emerald Lake Lodge. Um, the goal is to shoot Aurora and Orion. So um, mm -hmm. Orion is our winter constellation. And um, if you're, if you're super nerdy about it, you can bring your Astro modified camera and your trackers um, because we mm -hmm. can track and um, and we can use the modified cameras to pick up that nebulosity. If that's not something that you're into yet, that's totally fine. You can get amazing shots of Orion just without doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a slightly different uh, program because early November is pretty special here in the Rockies. Um, <laughs> every time, every time we went to a location, I'm like, you have to see this in November. You have to yeah. see this in November. Um, as you can, you know, depending on the weather, obviously it's, it's quite variable. You can still get frost flowers. Um, we can get early season methane bubbles at one of the lakes. Um, so sometimes you see the frozen methane bubbles in November, not always, but it's mm -hmm. possible. Um, and then also depending on the, the, sort of how the lakes freeze there's the potential to still see those green blue lakes that haven't frozen over yet so they're not snow covered and then you get the contrast between the green blue lake the snow potentially aurora orion you know <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things to shoot um and it's just a really beautiful landscape it's that transition into winter so typically not super cold but still could be so you have to be prepared either way um, but it's uh, a pretty special time of year and there's some, some magical things to shoot when you got that change in season. And so anyways, that's what we're planning for November 12th. It hasn't yes. been launched yet. Um, nope. So this is like, this, I feel like it's just a tease because we haven't <laughs> even... <laughs> We'll talk about it in in uh, in uh, next week in Rachel in Menorca, and uh, probably we'll be launching it in early June, June or something like that. Right. So you guys will have to keep an eye out. Yes, newsletter, guys, subscribe to the newsletter. You're not. Yeah. What up, Phil's newsletter? My newsletter, either one. We'll yeah. let you know. Rafa's is probably better with the newsletters than I am, though. In all honesty, <laughs> so you might want to follow his newsletter before mine. But I think I'm sending them to, to many videos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Questions, uh, Rachel. If you, yeah. pre you, you, if you want, you, we can go very quick. Uh, over I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as you guys still yes. have questions. Yeah. Okay. Is there any filter recommended, uh, like a polarizer or anything you use at night? No. Yes. No. Um. So there's no filter required or needed. Um. There's a few fun filters, and there's one that maybe you might want. Um. Not for like. The Canadian Rockies is like the darkest skies you're going to yeah. find anywhere. They're um, Bortle 1 into Bortle 2 skies. So I don't um, I don't have to worry about light pollution too much. But if you are in an area where there's light pollution, um, you can get light pollution filters and they can be helpful. Um, it's to, you know, you're still going to get light, but it is going to filter out certain wavelengths of light. So um, I do recommend those um, if you're looking for, you know, trying to shoot in a really bright place. Um, it's not going to be something where you can go out and shoot in Vegas, but um, it will help, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you have a, a city that's, you know, a few hundred kilometers or miles away and you've got that big bright glow on the horizon, you can kind of, you can use a filter mm -hmm. to reduce that. Um, so light pollution filters can be helpful. And there's a couple of fun filters that I use every now and again, not all the time. Um, one is uh, like a fog filter. So if you've ever been out photographing the stars, you may have noticed that if you get like a thin film of cloud, like, you know, just these wispy things or fog, 
that it makes the stars look more bloated, like they get kind of glowy and kind of big. And so um, one of the filters I like to use when I'm trying to do a more creative effect would be, it's called a Tiffin double fog filter, and it will create that sort of bloated glowy look. And I, I really like it for like Orion and stuff too, because it also intensifies the colors of the stars. So you see the blue and the yellow and you know the different colors. And then there's another one I use um, every once in a while by Hoya. And um, what that one does, I think it's called a sparkle. And they have different versions of it, a, F a sparkle four, a sparkle six, a sparkle eight. And it'll make diffraction spikes on the stars, on the bigger stars. Mm -hmm. So um, you can get that sort of twinkly look, you know. Um, so again, it's just a slightly different look. Um, and it can be very interesting in you know, if you're trying to come up with a certain creative style or creative look or creative feeling, um, you know, you want to make your, I don't know, you have people in your shot and you want to make it look magical and romantic or something like that, then <laughs> that, that can really help you to enhance your photo. So that one's by Hoya and they're the Hoya Sparkle series of filters. Um, I like the six times, four times, not it's only four spikes. Six is six spikes. Eight is almost like too much for me. Um, so I like the six personally. Great. Next question from Dave. Uh, do you ever use lens warmers? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So lens warmers can be really, really helpful. Um, if you, if you are shooting in cold climates or whatever, and you're, and you're accustomed to being in the cold. So I say that, I preface it that way, because if you go out and say, you're, let's say you're going to go on a, on a Canadian rock workshop with me, and you've never been out in the cold, you don't know how to manage your gear, like, you know, you're working with your mittens on, and you're trying to, you're fumbling around for buttons and stuff like that. Sometimes by the, by the time you figured out how to use your mittens, and then your hands warmer, your hands are already cold, and you've got to go warm up when you could have just been shooting already. So, um, yeah, if you're experienced and you know how to set up your gear and you know how to navigate your, you know, your equipment at night and, um, you're not struggling with, you know, big mitts and stuff like that. I totally recommend lens warmers because they can keep you shooting longer without having, um, you know, frost on your lens or things like that. Um, chances are your batteries are going to die before you get frost on your lens. Um, and you can clean frost. So it's not like a critical component, but it is nice to have. Um, and I just I just do the cautionary tale there, um, or say the cautionary tale, because I think that sometimes people get really focused on the, on the gear and the accessories and things like that. And then by the time they get things set up, they're too cold to enjoy the shoot, or they've had their fingers exposed or something like that. Um, so uh, if, if you're not experienced with gear, don't use it the first time you go out, you know, mm -hmm. make sure the other things are going to work first. Very cool. Another question from Marianne. Can you speak about lens condensation? Yeah. So I don't deal with a lot of lens condensation here because I have a really dry climate. But if you go from, if like, let's say I'm out in the cold and I bring my camera into the warm car and I'm reviewing my photos, you go from a really cold environment to a really warm environment, you can get condensation right inside the camera. So um, when you're Aurora shooting, if you're out shooting in the winter time, you wanna make sure that you put your camera back in your bag and you just close it up. You can take your battery out, take your memory card out, but you want the camera to come to temperature over a longer period of time inside the bag. Um, and then it's not going to get any condensation inside of it. You're, bag acts like a natural dehumidifier. And so you can reduce the amount of moisture you're going to deal with. Um, I always make sure I brush off anything that's on the, you know, on the actual camera or the lens. Um, sometimes I have locked my camera out to the point where I've grown frost flowers on it, like if I've time lapsed or something. Um, and you want to just make sure you remove any of that so that you don't have stuff melting into your bag. Um, brush it off as best you can and then use a cloth to wipe. Um, the other thing is if you get condensation or you get any like frost forming on your, on your lens, if you're winter shooting is pro if any moisture is going to come out as like frost. And so you'll have mm -hmm. this sort of semi frozen stuff and you want to make sure that you don't melt that into the glass when you're trying to wipe it off. 
So if you take a lens cloth and it's like your finger is there and you've got like one layer of lens cloth between your finger and the glass, the warmth from your finger, your cold finger is probably going to just cause a smear. So where possible, you want to use the blower and blow it off. And then you would kind of ball or wad up the lens cloth so that your the heat from your hand isn't touching anything and then use that to wipe so that you're not smearing any um, frost around on your lens because then you just get smear marks. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, such brother, <clears throat> given the cold and length of shooting, what advice on batteries external or internal? Um, so I don't ever use like a battery bank. Um, so I, I usually just use my, um, my camera batteries, the colder it is, you know, the quicker your batteries are going to die. Um, mm -hmm. but I've been out shooting in minus 50 with my camera and, um, you don't get very, <laughs> you don't get very long shooting at those temperatures. Uh, that's only happened once. It was kind of by mistake. Um, but typically minus 40, uh, you know, they're going to last maybe an hour, but, um, yeah, most of the time, you know, minus 20 with sort of average, I wouldn't call those average winter temperatures, but kind of average cold. Like if you were going to be here on a cold week or you're going to, you know, be out shooting in fairly cold temperatures, minus 20 is probably what you're going to experience. And the batteries will last for hours on any of the, of the new systems. There are some like the older Sony, uh, cameras were, the batteries were very small and they would die very quickly, like in 20 minutes, but the new ones are really good. Um, and I haven't seen anybody really struggle with batteries. Um, if you, like, let's say you go out and you shoot Milky Way or Aurora or something like that, and then you want to wait for blue hour to go and shoot the rest, chances are you want to take your battery out of your camera. You can leave your camera there. The cold doesn't hurt the camera too much. It doesn't hurt the camera at all unless it's like minus 50. But um, you want to take the battery out and then just keep it with you in your jacket or whatever. Cause just sitting there, even though it's not doing anything, even if you weren't taking pictures, the battery will discharge in the cold. So keep your batteries in your pockets. I actually have, um, Oh, do I have it here? I don't have it here. It's in another room, but in Norway, I found this like ridiculous, like puffy pouch, um, you know, like puffy jacket, a down jacket. Mm -hmm. I found a little pouch that was puffy and I bought it for my batteries and it has a, it's like a purse. I can wear it like a purse. And so I can wear it around my neck and then I can have the little pouch like, you know, against my, uh, so inside my jacket. So if it's really cold, I now have a down pouch for my batteries. I don't think it makes any difference really. Your pocket works just as well, but um, yeah. So you can get a down pouch and you can, so in that little, in that little, it's like a, it looks like a pencil case has a zipper on it, but it's down and I can put a chemical warmer in there and that would actually help to keep the batteries warm in the cold as well. Well, minus 40, minus 30, we got minus 42. So that was not, the, that was an yeah. experience. So that was, so they show up on the first night. I have to tell the story. <laughs> so I had a group right before photo pills came and my group was going home the day, like the, like, the morning, the night before the other group arrived. So I got one group going home on, I don't know if it was a Saturday and the next group coming in on a Sunday, whatever. But um, the forecast was for minus 39. And the group before you was so worried that their beloved photo pills, Rafa and Tony, <laughs> were going to freeze to death that like half of my group left warm gear for that for the next group because they were so worried about them like being too cold and not yeah. having the right gear it was the sweetest thing ever i actually just returned gear to john and graham and larry and uh mark so those four Thank guys, guys left a ton of gear boots and uh puffy pants and yeah all kinds yeah, of layers everything skin, all kinds of things uh, <laughs> Yeah, they did great. So even though it was really cold, we stayed, we did go out and shoot, but we stayed really close to the car. And the, and the rule was like, you just had to come in and warm up like every five minutes and, yeah. you know, or every few minutes and we left the car running and, and it, it went surprisingly well, but that was our very first night. I was like, welcome to Canada. It's minus 39. Um, and I think it actually did hit minus like 42. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And we got the Milky Way, so not and bad. Not Milky Way, yeah, it was pretty. Oh, a tangle pig, <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, question uh, from Marianne: uh, Shooting DX format rather than FX. Sorry, say that again. Shooting in DX format rather than FX in terms of the lens. Uh, I... DX instead of FX. I'm not sure. DX uh, versus FX. I... I don't know. I'm not a photographer, Rachel. So. <laughs> um, so if we're talking lenses, it's usually like manual versus auto okay. focus. Uh, unless we're talking like uh, FX is like a, I'm not sure what that term is referring to. I'd have to Google. And Googling. The DX format okay. is a smaller cen uh, sensor. Uh, the large full is F for, the FX is format sensor is larger. So a full frame maybe. Uh, Okay, full frame versus versus crop sensor. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and what's the question then specifically? Uh, what's the difference between or which one would you prefer? Like a large versus medium format? Oh. The X has fewer pixels, uh, Rob says. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're talking about like um, so some people shoot compressed versus uncompressed, um, medium. I think we're talking about full frame more, versus crop sensors. Frame versus crop or more pixels versus less pixels. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if you were shooting on like the A1 and I could go, I mean, I could put it in crop mode or I could just shoot it full, full frame. And then there's, oh, then there's um, some of the new cameras. Maybe this is what she's referring to. So like I know the new um, Sony A7 R5 has different modes where you can shoot actually like what resolution you want to shoot in. Um, okay. I have not played with that. I mean, obviously, I'm not even familiar yeah, with yeah. the video. So <laughs> okay. um, that's not something I think I could speak to with any any confidence. Sorry about that. Perfect. We have another question from Kim. Uh, could you mention your time lapse workflow, an interval or very quick? Uh, <laughs> interval okay, so is the shooting. Yeah. Exposure time, right? Plus um, one second. Plus exposure one second. time is the same. And for me, I could leave my, I just have a one second interval. Um, mm -hmm. So when you shoot one second intervals really, really well, no problem. Um, other cameras, typically not. Um, so you typically, um, even though there's one second in between, you probably have to, if you're shooting on a Canon, you have to leave at least two seconds, sometimes three, because otherwise when it starts running and it's, um, it's got to process the photos afterwards. It starts tripping over itself, so to speak. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but it'll take so many photos and then it'll start to buffer on the card or whatever it's doing. It just needs more time to process. If you only leave one second, it'll stop shooting. So um, I had somebody shooting a Canon on a recent thing and Oh yeah, and I so she she was like, oh, I think it'll shoot on one second because it's so it's a short exposure, and I'm like, okay, we'll give it a try, but it and it ran and it ran for a little while, but then it stopped. So yeah. Yeah. Um, the interval time is a little bit more dependent on your camera. On a Sony, one second is fine. Um, Canon and Nikon's, I I always err on the side of caution, and I go like three seconds in between because when you run it for a long period of time, it can, like I said, it can trip over itself. And the other thing that you really wanna make sure is that you turn off your two second timer, because if you're running a time lapse and you have your two second timer on, then you have a, a delay that your camera can't ignore, and then you have another program, and so then you have these competing programs, and that can be another thing that causes um, misalignment in the, in the timing of the sequence. Okay, thank you. Another question from Carl. What exposure time do you use if the aurora is dancing a lot? Um, so, yeah, most of the night um, with the PhotoPills team, we were shooting around between one and two seconds, um, depending on how bright it was. So that was another factor is like, you know, it was moving and it was dancing, but um, yeah, it was also insanely, insanely bright. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, between one and two seconds is probably a good, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a strong storm like what we saw, that's probably a good, uh, good. 
Yeah. Yes, I think Tony Oyo was mentioning that the, the, his shots were, uh, yeah, between one and two seconds. Yeah, anything more, and then you just end up with a like a yeah. smear across the image, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which okay, is a long two questions. seconds, for example. But you know, it, uh, it ranged like that whole night. Sometimes the aurora was more behind us and a little less in front of us, or you know, there was variability. And so sometimes I was shooting at two and a half seconds. Um, mm -hmm. But I know a lot of the night was between one and two seconds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The last two questions, Rachel. It's all uh, we're. Going over two hours now. So thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for your time. Yeah, I'm, I'm like keeping hydrated here as I talk. It is, it's 9 p.m. here. My, my stomach is starting to roll. So dinner time <laughs> is already uh, here. So let's go quick to these two questions. From Karen, uh, how many batteries and memory cards do you travel with when shooting? Like how many you bring to the camp this year? Okay, I I am gonna be very, I'm gonna be traveling really light going to camp. Um, yeah, yeah. I probably bring six batteries, which is mm -hmm. about okay. you no, know, I, I think I have fourteen or fifteen, but I also have three cameras. So at home, like I carry kind of all my gear all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when I travel, I pare it down. So. I try not to have so much weight and also it raises a few eyebrows when you're traveling if you carry too many batteries you can actually get in trouble i learned the hard way yeah. for having like too much amperage like collectively in all of your batteries so yeah i'll probably travel with six but yeah, yeah that's lots yeah. if you can charge every day it's not a problem perfect though and the last one easy one white headlamp versus red headlamp which one sorry what was the question uh about the headlamp color white or red Oh my gosh. So I joke that if you, if you bring a red headlamp, I'm going to feed you to the coyotes. Um, <laughs> so red headlamps are very good when it comes to letting your eyes adjust from its dark adaptation, right? So if you're, if you have a light on a bright light, say your 750 lumen or whatever headlamp to go walk around out in the night, you can see everything really well. But as soon as you turn that light off, it takes some time for you to adapt to the dark. Uh, for your eyes to adapt to the dark because you you go from one um from your from one part of your visual system your cones and you have to switch over to the rods so that's the the photoreceptors in your eyes you have cones and you have rods and the cones work in bright light and they allow us to see color and stuff like that and then um, in darkness those cones don't have enough light to activate. So we rely on the rods. And so there's this period of adaptation when you switch from one photoreceptor to another photoreceptor, dark adaptation. And so there's a period of time where you have to let your eyes adjust to the light. If you're using that red light, it, that period is much shorter. It's a lot easier for your eyes to adjust between having your light on and turning it off. The reason I would say to the coyotes when you try to be gentle on your eyes is because if you have a red light on and you need that, that light so that you can see something on the back of your camera or whatever, and you're splashing red light all over a foreground during an aurora, <laughs> probably mm -hmm. the entire group is going to want to feed you to the coyotes. So as preemptively, it's just better to have a white light because at worst case scenario, a white light is a little bit of light painting and you might even get something cool but there is no recovery of your foreground with a red light. Awesome, Rachel. I do agree. I do agree. Thank you so much for your time again. Thank you so much. Thank you so it's much been, uh... for having me. And you guys, I don't know how, but I was trying to be short this time. Like, I'm like, I'm going to, it's going to be an hour. This I'm, I only have 40 slides. It ended up being 43 <laughs> slides. I'm like, it's only going to be an hour. And here we are. Rafa's You're forcing me. You're forcing me to learn photography. I know. I, I know that you have a plan, but I'm not buying a camera. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, that's exciting. I'm not. I'm not. So, uh, well, Rachel, thank you so much again for uh, your time and sharing your expertise. You're always giving everything you have inside and more. Okay. And I can't wait to meet you. Welcome you again for a second time uh, in Menorca. Okay. And have more adventures, photography adventures in the future together. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be uh, here and um, yeah. sharing this with your community. And I always just appreciate being a part of it. So thanks for having me. 
Awesome, awesome. And for all, all of you already, 163 people are here with, with us, two hours <laughs> of uh, amazing learning and adventure with Rachel Jones. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, as always, if you like this video, give us a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next Wednesday in another video. And next Wednesday, the video is going to be pretty cool. Actually, the next weeks are going to be pretty cool. Uh, yeah. And uh, as always, remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot like in the referral. So I'm going to say goodbye, Rachel. Goodbye, Rachel. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, see everyone. Thanks for hanging in there. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. See, see you next week, next time. Bye. Rachel, you have to come back and teach more edi editing and shooting. Okay. There's <laughs> not, not, not